In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today, we honor the 17th century apostle to the West Indies, St. Peter Claver. He not only became the slave of the slaves, meaning that he dedicated his life to their service, but he also served many others, such as Muslims and those who had fallen into heresy, as well as those sentenced to die on the scaffold. He worked tremendous feats, miracles of raising people from the dead, prophesying the future death of others, and many other similar things. How did he do all this? Well, a principle comes to mind. There is no evangelization without contemplation. There is no evangelization without contemplation. St. Peter Claver would spend five or more consecutive hours in prayer before going out on his duties every morning. He needed these times of prayer for the very difficult task of evangelizing the slaves and their masters, who often worked against him. Are we surprised? but even more to overcome his own choleric nature. He needed to pray. He was very much prone to anger. Listen to the reports given about him to Rome over his life. He was born in 1581. Now, the first report is from 1616, the year of his ordination and the start of his mission in Colombia. Mental powers, less than mediocre. Prudence, lacking. Character, choleric. Ability for the mission work, useful for hearing confessions and dealing with the natives. 1616. Well, let's go forward a few years. 1642. Mental powers, mediocre. Prudence, lacking. Character, very melancholic. Well, now that's a change. He went from choleric to very melancholic. Let's go to 1649. Now, he died in 1654. 1649, mental powers good. Prudence and experience of the world, nil. As he got older, he seems to have gotten more uh, unworldly. Character, melancholic. He says in the missions... Outstanding in his dealings with the Negroes. Well, we see he starts out rather fiery, but after calming himself down, he is labeled melancholic, which most likely is patience and virtue rather than melancholy. In any case, listen to the basic schedule he followed for something like 45 years of his life. As night fell, he slept for a short while, often three hours or so. Then from midnight to one, he got up to enjoy, so he said, the silence and peace which God granted him when all slept. How does St. John of the Cross say it? One dark night, fired with love's urgent longings, I went out unseen, my house being now all quiet, all still. What a great time to pray early in the morning. Then, either kneeling or prostrate on the ground, often with symbols of the passion on him, like a crown of thorns or a rope around his neck, the crucifix in hand, he prayed until six in the morning. Then he went out to work. Like many of the saints, he is known to have had a special gift for bringing souls to God, especially those who seemed farthest away. Some examples. He considered those condemned to death to be his friends. And so the officials always called him in shortly before they died. He would hear their confessions and offer mass for them in prison. He would say things to them like, Brothers, To escape from this torment, there is no other remedy but to keep close to our Lord. As those suffering shipwreck cling to a plank to escape from the sea. Here, brothers, you have the true plank. 
Addressing himself to the condemned man, he would say, Happy are you who know your last day. Happy should I be if I knew mine. It is a piece of great good fortune that death should come to us while we are in full possession of our senses and our reason is free to rest on that point on which our eternal happiness or misery depends. How many people today want to be drugged up for their death? Who want to die in their sleep? This is not the way of a saint. Let's repeat what he says. Happy are you that you know your last day, and happy should I be if I knew mine. It is a piece of great good fortune that death should come to us while we are in full possession of our senses, and our reason is free to rest on that point on which our eternal happiness or misery depends." We must all come to it either by a shortcut or by a long way round in time. But what does it matter if the shortcut be the hard one of the gallows, if it means that the way is the more certain? He would even encourage them to do penance in the time remaining them, handing them a discipline, saying, Brothers, suffer. Now that you have time, you can acquire merit. He gave them a last meal to enjoy, wiped the sweat from their face, and held them tenderly when they died. And often, the ropes were not very good at that time, and they would break even two or three times before the man died. Then he would say a public requiem mass with great solemnity for those who died repentant. As for Muslims, he converted many in his life, patiently waiting for them to come to the truth. Now, how did he do it? Now, Claver's way was to persevere in doing them all possible small services to attract them by gentleness to win their hearts. And through this humble constancy, he gained notable victories over their fanaticism. One took 22 years to convert, some others over 30 And one converted only after 40 years. Most of them he baptized on their deathbed. Do we have the patience to wait this long for a conversion? St. Peter did. Do we love souls? He loved souls. He was also heroic in the confessional. In Cartagena, the church and especially the confessional were stifling hot and damp because of the proximity to the sea. St. Peter's was an oven. During Lent, the saint heard something like 5,000 confessions. Imagine that. 5,000 confessions. A witness writes, Every day, he used to spend the whole morning in the confessional, and sometimes he started hearing confessions at 8 at night and carried on till 11 the next morning. As a result, he was sometimes in a state of collapse which prevented him from even saying the Holy Mass. What a dedicated soul. He was so humble that the superiors would not put him in charge. They tried once, but disaster resulted. One of his subordinates said, how could he take charge of the brothers when he could not even impose his will on black slaves? For these latter, he obeys implicitly and humbly. He set aside all the hardest and most menial tasks for himself, such that it was shrewdly said of him to put him in charge was to make him the slave of those inside the residence, adding a fresh servitude to the one he had already accepted under those outside the residence. He had already become a slave to the slaves. And now they're going to put him in charge of something inside the house and he'll become a slave to his brothers in religion. But his first love was always toward the black slaves whom he served faithfully. He is known to have baptized something like 300,000 of them. But he also took great care of them by helping them when they were in distress, continuing their education, 
hearing their confessions and watching over them to prevent them from falling back into immodesty, lewd dancing, superstition, and other evils. He was truly a father to them, and they loved him, even when he would severely discipline them for trying to bring out the drums or act immodestly in any way. They knew he cared for them, that he loved them, that he wanted them to go to heaven. They did not hold it against him. Let us close with one of his sayings, a summary of his battle plan that shows how deeply humble this man really was. This is incredible saying from St. Peter Claver, from his own notebook. Every time I do not behave like a donkey, it is the worst for me. How does a donkey behave? If it is slandered, it keeps silent. If it is not fed, silence. If it is forgotten, silence. It never complains however much it is attacked or ill-treated because... It is as long-suffering as a donkey. This is how the servant of God must behave. I stand before you, dear Lord, like a donkey. St. Peter died on Our Lady's birthday in 1654, silently in the early hours of the morning, as if he were falling asleep. His companions only realized he was gone when his face shone with extraordinary brilliance and loveliness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.